from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 23, recorded on December 19th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. And today we're going to take a closer look at Paul's column, Vaccine Safety by Marjorie Taylor Greene, Part 3. So in the previous Beyond the Noise, number 22, uh, we, we talked about Paul's first two uh, blog posts, Parts 1 and 2. Today it's all about Part three. And just to remind you, on November 13th, 2023, Marjorie Taylor Greene, a, a Republican representative from Georgia, held a meeting to discuss COVID vaccines. And we talked about the first two of three people who testified. The third person to testify at Greene's meeting was Robert Malone. So, so Paul, tell us a little bit about what kind of research uh, Malone has done in his career. Right, so... Robert Malone got a Master of Science degree from the University of California Systems in the 1980s. Um, in 1991, he uh, graduated from Northwestern Medical School, followed by a postdoc uh, at uh, Harvard. So he, he's a, a, an accomplished scientist. I mean, he, he published two papers in the late 1980s, in many ways establishing a platform for mRNA technology. The first uh, paper looked at taking naked mRNA uh, putting it in laboratory cells and finding that you could then translate that MRA to a protein. In his case, the protein was luciferase, which caused the cells to light up. And then he pretty much did the same thing, except this time he injected it into the muscles of mice, which then made that protein in much the same way that the um, mRNA vaccines make a protein today by Pfizer, Moderna's mRNA vaccines. I mean, he didn't, he's not the creator of today's mRNA vaccines because there were still things that had to be done. You had to essentially um, use nucleoside analogs um, instead of um, to substitute those in to lessen the uh, inflammatory or pro-inflammatory effect of mRNA. You had to stabilize the the fusion protein, the spike protein in a pre-fusion state, which required prolines, um, which he didn't do. And then also you had to put it in a lipid uh, nanolayer so it didn't get broken down by mRNA. So all that had to happen, but it was important work. And he, I think, was an, an accomplished scientist, which makes his testimony in front of Marjorie Taylor Greene all the more difficult to understand. Many people say he should have gotten the, the Nobel Prize, but he, as you say, he didn't do the essential work that was needed to make vaccines to show, for example, that you need uh, modified mRNA. That was crucial development. For which a um, Nobel Prize was awarded to Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico. Right. All right. So uh, Malone claims that the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna are contaminated with DNA. What do you say to that? So I think at some level you need to understand how mRNA vaccines are made. The starting material is a double-stranded uh, plasmid made of DNA into which one has inserted the DNA that codes for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Then that, that plasmid goes through a series of steps whereby you amplify the plasmid, you ultimately cut the plasmid with uh, restriction enzymes that allow that piece of, of DNA uh, that codes for the spike protein to, to be uh, purified and isolated. And then you use RNA polymerase to, um, to convert that DNA to uh, RNA, and that um, is then again purified, treated with uh, fragments, treated with an enzyme like DNA ACE that, that cuts uh, any residual DNA. So what you have at the end is you have uh, messenger RNA, which you then put into a lipid nanoparticle, but there is trace quantities of DNA from that original plasmid. Um, by trace, what I mean is nanogram levels, so billionths of a gram. And, and, and so you are inoculated with billions of a gram of these small fragmented pieces of DNA. And people were worry, could that then affect your own DNA? But there's a number of reasons for why that wouldn't be true. One is first it would have to enter the cytoplasm and, and um, our cytoplasm for the most part hates uh, foreign DNA and there's 
There's innate immune response and restriction factors and enzymes that are designed to really eliminate that DNA. Um, then it would have to enter the nucleus, which is hard to do, virtually impossible to do in a resting cell. There's not a nuclear access signal, so it really couldn't enter your, your nucleus, which is where DNA resides. And then it would have to insert itself into your DNA, which requires an integrase, which it also doesn't have. So it's utterly and completely harmless. To put this in some level of perspective, there's a um, vaccine that's given in India. It's called Zyco-D. It's two milligrams of essentially that plasmid DNA that's used as a starting material for mRNA vaccines. It's given intradermally by a jet injector to damage cells so that then it can enter. It's two milligrams, which is a thousandth of a gram. Here you have nanogram levels of, of this residual fragmented DNA. That's a million fold difference. And um, so... It's utterly harmless. And, and um, I think, um, you know, you've made this point before that, that any, any virus, viruses grow in cells. They're not like bacteria where you can grow them in broth or in agar. They grow in cells, so they require cellular machi machinery to grow. So all vaccines, the viral vaccines that are made, for the most part, have these small fragmented pieces of DNA, like the measles vaccine or the mumps vaccine or the rubella vaccine, or the first live attenuated viral vaccine, the yellow fever vaccine that we've been using since the, like the 1930s. So, um, so this notion of small fragmented DNA uh, uh, fragments doing harm is just uh, utter nonsense. As we said before, we eat a lot of food. It all has DNA in it, right? We are full of bacteria in all parts of our bodies that have DNA. And in fact, some of that bacterial DNA occasionally gets incorporated into our genome. It doesn't make any difference. Did, did Malone say why it was a problem that there were small amounts of, of DNA fragments in the vaccine? No, he just said that because this DNA was there, it was going to affect our DNA and cause cancers like leukemia and lymphoma, cause autoimmune diseases, and cause a variety of other diseases. He then went a step further, and he said that, that because it's in there, now the government can tell by marking you, essentially, with, with this foreign DNA as to who's been vaccinated or who hasn't. And then he took a step further and said, the CIA, CIA has its fingerprints all over this. So I think this, this in many ways, brilliant scientist, who I think is, is especially uh, adept at being able to uh, translate science uh, to the public so that it's easily understandable. It, essentially, I think his scientific reasoning is trumped by his notion that there's a vast conspiracy by the federal government and pharmaceutical companies and healthcare professionals to harm the American public. And he's going to stand in the way and not let, let that happen. Isn't it true, Paul, that any vaccine grown in a cell will have some DNA in it? Uh, absolutely. Have small fragments of DNA. And so, and so the, the FDA has guidelines for how much is allowable. And, and so we're talking about nanogram levels. That is trace levels. I wish in terms of uh, using uh, uh, the best kind of wording for this, what the, what the, for example, anti-vaccine activists, they'll call that contaminants. It's not a contaminant, it's a manufacturing residual. And there are many other similar manufacturing residuals because you can't take the biologicals out of biologicals. You have to grow viruses and cells for the most part. So all these nuances and subtleties that we've been talking now about for a few minutes, don't you think Malone should have brought those up at the, at the committee hearing? Yes. I, and I think he, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know Robert Malone. I've never met him, but I, but reading his two papers that he wrote in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the late eighties, which is, you know, a prestigious journal. Um, I think he's, I think he's in many ways a brilliant scientist. So I would have to believe he knows those things yet. He chose not to say them. We don't know his motivations, but, um, I wonder what makes a scientist go astray and say things that are essentially incorrect. I'm, my guess, he's mad that he's not getting any credit for mRNA vaccines. So you, you think that's a reasonable argument or is there something else? I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, I certainly think he did important work. It wasn't Nobel Prize winning work. I think the Nobel Prize was correctly given to Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico for using those nucleoside analogs to modify mRNA so that it wasn't uh, pro-inflammatory. That was critical work. I think McClellan, who did the work with the, the proline residues to sort of link or lock this, this uh, protein into its pre-fusion state, was critical work and could arguably have won the Nobel Prize. The people who did the, the lipid nanoparticle work, I think, was critical because you had to avoid those 
those RNA aces that are in uh, the circulation in lymphatics and all Nobel Prize winning work, arguably. But his work, I would say, was not that. In any case, uh, if that's the reason, if he's angry because he didn't win the Nobel Prize and his reaction to that is to misinform the American public or disinform the American public so that they make bad decisions for themselves or their children, that's a sad story. It's been a few years now that we've been using these mRNA vaccines and we haven't seen any cancers associated with them. They would, Malone would probably argue that it's not soon enough, right? Well, um, sure. I guess that's possible. I, the, the, you can always make the argument, and this is often made, is, yeah, sure, you know, we, we don't see any problem now, but we, we don't know five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. You, you can make the same argument, actually, with the um, the uh, the um, vaccines, the polio vaccines that were used, and you know this better than me, in the mid-1950s when they were contaminated with SV40 virus, at least the early lots. And we knew that this simian virus 40, this polyomavirus, could cause cancer in experimental animals. Could it cause cancer in children? because children were inoculated with those vaccines. And we now know five years later, eight years later, 15 years later, 30 years later, that that wasn't true. Um, but um, sure, th this is often the argument that the anti-vaccine activists made. Yeah, sure, you have like four years worth of this vaccine, but we don't have 10 years or 20 years. Last thing that Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, concluded after this hearing, this is the worst thing that has happened to this country in my lifetime and the role of the government cannot be denied. And so- Obviously, she has political motivations for doing this whole uh, committee meeting, right? She's probably not the best person to educate the American public about science and medicine. I agree. All right. You can find the um, original column over at Beyond the Noise and Substack. There will be a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. 